Gosh, is it nice being back together with people. You know, I knew the world was returning to normal when I sat in my Wisconsin Badgers uh, football stadium with 84,000 other people, and then I went to Lambeau to watch my Green Bay Packers with another 78,000 people, and I said, how nice is it to be back interacting as humans, uh, which we also need. Well, it's wonderful all having you here. 12 years have gone by since we started our first economic forum, and wow, does 12 years go by fast. But it's been great seeing the growth. It's great seeing the wonderful turnout, even with the 55 being dislocated this morning. But uh, yeah, it's wonderful being here and seeing all of you. And thank you very much for coming. All right, we're going to get into a economic outlook. And by the time I'm done, I don't want you throwing stuff at me and hating on me. I'm just here to give you facts. Because I think right now, we are at an incredibly important time in our country's history from an economic standpoint. And it's not a good time. But you know, I could come up here and sugarcoat things or I could come up here and give you information to allow you to make sound and wise decisions. Because I think that's the most important thing we can have right now, is knowledge to navigate these turbulent storms that have already started and are only going to get worse over the next few years from an economic standpoint. So I'm going to move through a lot of economic data. Don't stress, you can always get the whole presentation, it'll be online. So if you're trying to write things down because you want a piece of information, it'll be there available for you. I'm gonna move pretty quickly through the uh, economics of where kind of we are, and then I'm gonna get into the big issues going forward, and that's where I'm gonna slow down and really talk about it. So let's get going. Oh, I'm, I have to get my clicker. Here we go. All right. Every year I make predictions. It's been difficult this uh, past couple years because we got hit with the ultimate black swan event called COVID. Last year, I said predicting the and forecasting GDP would be futile, but it would have a high degree of volatility quarter to quarter, and GDP growth would be positive for the year 2021, depending on the size structure of the monetary and fiscal stimulus. Well, GDP was positive. It was actually better than I would have expected. It came in at 6.3% in Q1, 67 in Q2. Slowed down a lot in Q3 to only 2%. Now, part of that is probably because of the Delta spike, but there's other factors that played into it as well. Why did GDP do better? Because, man, we shoved a lot of money into the system, both from a federal spending standpoint as well as from a monetary standpoint. The Federal Reserve, after injecting $3 trillion into the capital markets, injected a whole nother trillion dollars this past year. Second prediction, I said after experiencing a partial V-shaped recovery in 2020, where we'd go from here would depend on who won the presidential election and the policies he or she enacted. Well, President Biden won. Uh, he aligned himself with the progressive wings. They immediately uh, spent another $1.9 trillion after we had just done another big package, I'll get into that later, and has continued to push for additional fiscal stimulus through an infrastructure plan and Build Back Better uh, Act. I said predicting uh, unemployment would continue uh, to decline, albeit at a slower pace, but it would remain high as larger corporations instituted layoffs aimed at white collar jobs, blue collar and lower income employment numbers would continue to improve. Well, there wasn't a lot of layoffs uh, with white collar, so I was wrong on that. Uh, blue collar labor boomed back uh, as restaurants started opening back up, hotels, uh, recreational facilities, the whole travel and leisure and retail started reopening. So unemployment has fallen to 4.8%. I'll get into that. It's significantly down, but still above uh, pre-COVID levels. 
Okay, uh, on rates in the equity markets, predicted that the 10-year Treasury would have volatility between 0.6 and a 1.2 yield, with short-term rates anchored at zero. If the massive stimulus bill passed and inflation spiked, the 10-year could rise to 2%. That's pretty good on it. Short rates stayed anchored at zero. The Fed was very clear on that, so it was an easy prediction to make. The 10-year Treasury fluctuated between 1% and 1.75%, uh, and then reversed, uh, or peaked out at 1.75, and then reversed back down to 1.2 in August, and is now at 1.61. Who knows what it is this morning, but that's where it was yesterday. Equity markets would incorporate too many variables to predict the direction of valuations, but predicted that volatility would remain high. You know what? There wasn't much volatility. It was a one-way grind straight up because the Fed kept injecting liquidity and the federal government kept spending money. The equity markets just kept rising. Predicted certain goods and services may show some deflation, but the Federal Reserve's massive expansion of the money supply, asset prices, and commodity prices would inflate. We'll be getting into that very shortly, and that's exactly what happened. Real estate values would depend on the demand and cost of availability of financing. Well, rates have remained zero, uh, long rates have been exceptionally low, and banks have been more than willing to lend on real estate. So real estate values have continued to lift. And lastly, democratic, demographic shifts out of high cost, high tax states would only accelerate. We have had the biggest demographic moves that we've ever seen in our country in such a compressed period of time. For those clients of ours in Utah or Boise or Arizona, you know what has unfolded. People have been flooding into those markets, and a lot of them coming from this state of California. All right, I, I can't start this without addressing a COVID. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on COVID. I'm going to make it quick because... Uh, so much discussion about COVID, and I look forward to where we don't really spend any time talking about it. But let's just kind of take a look at where we are. Okay, so the dark line is the daily tests. We maxed out at testing almost 2 million people a day. Uh, daily cases right now are at 71,000. Uh, I think we peaked out somewhere 200,000 uh, uh, with daily cases. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, more importantly, hospital occupancy and COVID deaths. Uh, at our worst, we peaked out around 4,000 daily deaths. Right now, we're at 1,150. Uh, and hospitalizations were at 42,000. So we've had this big roller coaster, and that big secondary spike uh, was Delta. Same dynamic has played out in Europe, wherever Delta has been. You get this big ramp up and spike, it crests, and then it rolls back over. Folks, I think what we've done is we have now moved out of a pandemic to an endemic. What do I mean by that? COVID's gonna be with us. That's just the reality of it. It's, it's not gonna go away. Vaccines, we now know their effectiveness really are last for about 20 weeks meaningfully. Uh, sure, they have an impact on the repercussions if you get COVID and, and the degree of symptoms, but to think that COVID's gonna go away, it's not. It's a coronavirus, the cold is a coronavirus. I think we're gonna have to come to live with it. Fortunately, with most viruses, the more it passes from person to person, the less deadly it becomes. And I think that's the world we're going to be living in. Uh, these are uh, the last things I'll address on COVID. Uh, the lines, the series of lines, are vaccine, vaccination rates by different age groups, 75 plus, 65 to 74, and all the way on down. Obviously, the, the older cohorts have, have the highest rate of vaccination. The younger don't. Uh, the survival rates, which are very important, um, because remember, when COVID first came, we were very concerned that the death rate could be very high. But then as we started learning more and more, we realized that the death rate was much lower than what was initially feared. And COVID's a, a weird dynamic. It really does not have much of any effect on younger people. Um, the normal flu will always kill a couple thousand, two, three thousand infants every year. COVID, I think, worldwide has killed 
540 uh, children um, and young children, and if I'm correct, they think most of those had other serious health issues, so it's even hard to uh, tie it to uh, COVID. And the reason is because young children off, operate off of their innate immune system. You're born with an innate immune system. And their innate immune system just takes COVID and kicks it right out. In fact, a lot of times they don't even develop antibodies to COVID. Uh, where we, as we age, we develop a complex immune system. And our complex immune system comes from dealing with bacteria, viruses, and all the rest. And because this is a novel virus, uh, us who are older have never had that introduced to have our immune system know how to process and deal with it. So for the younger generation, uh, they're operating off their innate immune system, and it just doesn't have a big impact. Now, the interesting thing that will come is we've already had big issues over forced vaccinations in this country. If you think that's bad, if the government starts in trying to forcing kids to be forced vaccination, I think we're going to have a, a lot more political strife around that issue because it's one thing to be told you have to be vaccinated, it's another thing to tell you that you have to vaccinate your child. And if you're worried about your child from the vaccine, because there are issues for younger people, myocarditis and pericarditis, they know that. Um, so, uh, and in fact, uh, the Moderna vaccine has been now limited or banned in several European countries because of the risk of that. So that's a quick summary on uh, uh, COVID. Let's hope it just all kind of fades away over time. But as I said, I think it's moved from a pandemic to an endemic and, and we're gonna have to just be living with it. But fortunately, it had a lot lesser impact to all of us and to our country. Now let's get into economics. I call it the sugar high economy. The economy continued to recover across the state and country, propelled largely by what? Stimulus. Stimulus from our federal government, stimulus from our central bank, the Federal Reserve. So the big question is, how will 2020 be with the stimulus starting to come out? Let's look at this past year. First, we'll start with US GDP. As we all know, First quarter of 2020, the economy took a hit when COVID started moving and the uh, very beginning of the lockdown started. And then we had the biggest collapse in GDP in our country's history, down 31.2%, unprecedented as we shut down the economy. Then, ironically, the very next quarter, as all these stimulus checks went out and people were stuck at home, started spending money, fixing up their homes, buying boats, buying bicycles, all the rest, the economy flew. And then the economy continued to pick up and pick up. Now, recall when you have a drop, a percentage drop, that's a, a bigger impact than the number going back up. You have to have a bigger percentage going back up. Real simple, you're at 100, you go down by 50, you go to 50, to get back to 100, you have to go up 100. So the fact that we went down 31.2%, uh, and I can't remember the amount we went down in uh, first quarter, but that meant we had to have growth of 53% to get back to where we were pre-lockdowns. Uh, uh, the good thing is, we have achieved that. Uh, the economy has put together growth where our GDP is now above where it was previously. And our uh, GDP is now at $23.2 trillion. Now here's what's probably been the biggest driver of it, retail sales. Again, very interesting dynamic. Things fell off a cliff when the uh, lockdown first started. This is monthly, month over month. Uh, and just got cratered in April. And then we had the skyrocketing boom back up as, again, people stuck at home started spending money. And it was tied directly to their stimulus checks. And then it started coming back as that stimulus came out. And then recall, there were two more stimulus checks, one at the end of the year and then at the beginning of uh, 2021. 
Now retail sales have settled in up a point eight last month, uh, still relatively good. But the question is, how long can this last? How much spending did we pull out of the future and bring into now? You know, you can only do so many improvements on your, on your home. You can only buy so many bikes. Now, we're gonna see some shifting in spending. There's no question, you're gonna see a lot more spending in restaurants, air travel, it's already happening, hotels. So there's a variety of different areas that you're gonna see an uptick in spending, but can it be maintained at this level? This is the manufacturing index. That red line is 50. The way they measure this is anything above 50 is expansion. Anything below 50 is contraction. We have been at a very high level of expansion. Again, a lot of it generated by all this consumer spending. Factories having to put it into high gear and produce a lot of goods. Next. Okay, this is weekly and initial jobless claims. Recall when the lockdowns first started, unemployment just spiked. I mean, went through the roof. Uh, we were the highest initial jobless claims prior to this was sometime in 81 when Volcker uh, had to take interest rates to 18, 20%, and I think it was 600,000 a week, and we were running at 7 million a week. Uh, at, at its peak. Uh, continuing claims peaked out at 23 million people. Now here's the good thing. Look at how those lines have collapsed back down as the economy has recovered and started to restore itself. We're not quite back, but we're pretty close to where we were before this whole thing started. Great news. This is the long-term unemployment rate. Again, big spike, big spike back down. Right now, we're at 4.8%. We peaked out at 14.8%. Uh, we're not to where we were pre-pandemic, which is 3.5%. And the way I measure unemployment is not, you know, the headline, it's U6. They give you the U6 at the same time. Why is U6? Because it gives you a bigger perspective into unemployment. Because U6 factors in disenfranchised workers, people that are working part-time, that would like to have a full-time job and people who are loosely tied to the labor force. But still, pretty good at 8.5, not quite to the pre-pandemic low of 7%. This is a very interesting graph. This is the labor participation rate. And what does that mean? It tells you what percentage of our population is actually in the labor force. In the 50s and 60s and early 70s, we only operate about 55, high 50% of our population in the workforce because most women stayed at home, raised their kids. Then with the advent of the late 70s and 80s, women flooded into the job market and our participation rate just kept moving up and up and up and it peaked out in, uh, well, I think it says it here, at 67.3% in March of 2000 uh, during, you know, turn of the century. Now, it has been continuously moving down, and it took a big collapse, and we've lost about three million people permanently out of our workforce. Now, part of that is the baby boom generation. A lot of people with you know, COVID coming, they're getting close to retirement anyways, just said, you know what, I'm done, I'm out. I've saved up enough. The, I've, the equity markets have treated me well, I'm cashing out, and so they've just left. But here's the weird thing. Another big chunk of it is the younger population. Middle-aged population has stayed the same. It's our younger people. There is something going on with our younger people not entering into the labor force like they have in the past. I fear part of it could be the big chronic drug problem that our country has had with opiates. I think part of it is kids haven't been taught the same work ethic uh, that the baby boom generations has. 
there could be a variety of different reasons, but there is this trend line that younger people are not as incorporated into the labor force as they have been in the past. But we need to get some of these jobs back. To have an economy really functioning well, we really want to see that uh, participation rate jump back up. Averagely our earnings, again, we're dynamic. We talked about this last year. Big spike up when employment is crashing. How the heck did that happen? Well, part of it was stimulus checks, part of it was the supercharge unemployment, but another big part of it, as blue collar jobs fell off and white collar jobs stayed, the higher income people were still employed, so that naturally spiked that up. Then it came back down as blue collar labor started coming back into the labor force, and now it's moved back up, and it's probably settled in kind of where it will be, which is at a higher level than what we've seen for a very long time. And that ties into inflation, which we'll be getting into. All right, so we had history's most expensive sugar rush. Never seen anything like it where a government put that much money into economy, never did it in the Great Depression, uh, didn't do it in the Great Financial Recession. These are the different packages. Most of you know about the CARES Act in 2000, March of 2000, PPP was first launched, the first set of stimulus checks, the bailout for the airline industry, a whole host of things, 2.2 trillion. Let's put that in context. During the Great Financial Recession, we spent 787 billion. And let me tell you, there were more structural problems during the Great Financial Recession than there were during COVID. COVID was a shock because we shut down the economy. So we really pumped the money in, but then they kept going. There was 400 billion in other related bills. Then in December, they pumped another 900 billion, another round of stimulus checks. And then when President Biden came in and the Democrats, they shoved another 1.9 trillion, more stimulus checks. A lot of it was just pure politics. President Trump, you know, we should pay 2,000, and then because the George elections were coming up, oh, we Democrats, we will give you the money. They were running ads in Georgia saying, if you vote for our senators, we'll send you the $2,000. So a lot of it was politics, and unfortunately, uh, there's gonna be cost to this. So we spent $5.4 trillion, uh, an ungodly amount uh, over just a very short period of time. So what's the consequence of that? We're running a deficit last year, ran it at 3.1 trillion. Yes, 3.1 trillion. And this year it's estimated to be 3.4 trillion. Folks, we're running in one year deficits that are more than 13% of our GDP. That is so unsustainable it's not even funny. I mean, it's like Washington, D.C. has lost any kind of sense of fiscal responsibility. It has never been good for the last 15 years, but now it's just downright terrible. Central Bank, this is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Why am I showing you this? Because this has as much of an impact as all the spending that they're doing. Now, what are these lines? Okay, first if you see from 2002, and you could take this back decades, it's always kind of been a consistent line, largely made up of the red line, which are U.S. Treasuries. That's how the Federal Reserve managed their balance sheet. Then all of a sudden, you had this huge spike up. That was at, uh, in 2008, end of 2007, 2008, during the Great Financial Recession. The Federal Reserve came in and started buying more treasuries, but they also started buying MBS and really expanding that. So their total assets, because they were trying to repair the housing market. Then they kind of tapered it off in 2011, 2012. The economy wasn't growing enough for them. So they jammed more money, and they eventually grew their balance sheet to about $4.6 trillion. So they put basically 
$4 trillion over a stretch of period of years into the economy to liquefy the economy. Then they started taking it out in 2018. The equity markets had a big hissy fit, if you recall. And then they started growing it gradually. And then all of a sudden COVID happened. Boom. They went off to the charts. Treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, their whole balance sheet just massively expanded. They sent $3 trillion last year into the capital markets and another trillion this year. So what has all this stimulus and 0% interest rates led to? The capital markets casino. Equity market valuations have exploded. As you recall, last year I had the most prevailing thing that people would ask me is, how can the equity markets be rising when the economy is getting crashed? And it was one simple reason. Look at what the Federal Reserve was doing. The more money they pump into the system, the more it's going to rise asset values. Because again, what does the Fed do when they expand their balance sheet? They buy mortgage-backed securities, they buy treasuries off the balance sheets of banks, insurance companies, investment banks, pension plans. They take that on their balance sheet. What do they send back? They send back cash. What does that cash do? That cash goes looking for a home to generate a return. And so money flooded into the equity markets and into the bond markets. So uh, after last year's uh, big returns, now we have the equity markets up, the Dow up 18%, NASDAQ up 21% this year, and the S&P 500 up 23%. Interesting, I show you the different sectors and how they've performed. If you recall from last year, the worst performing sector last year was energy. Remember when energy prices went negative last year because they didn't even know what they could do with the oil? Financials were the second worst performer. Now, what are the two best performers? Energy and financials. Technology and infotech, which had huge years last year, still had a pretty good year this year. Uh, up, uh, infotech up 24.47. Uh, real estate was the third best performer. REITs got hit, but not as bad as financials and energy last year. What the Federal Reserve has done now has created the biggest bubble in equity market history. We've never had a bubble like this in our country's history again. What does this graph show? This graph is looking at companies with a, uh, the total share of market cap of companies that are trading at over 20 times sales. Now, in my personal opinion, no company should ever trade over 20 times sales. Uh, companies should be valued off what they can produce in cash and earnings. But we've only saw this one other time where during the heart of the internet bubble, $3.6 trillion of market cap companies were trading at over 20 times sales. Now we have $4.5 trillion. Folks, I could, have I could sit here all day long, and I have some more, show you graphs to show you how distorted our capital markets and equity markets are today. I, I could have pulled a graph where I was debating uh, another one that was showing the amount of companies that are losing money, have lost money for three years, and how, what percentage of their market cap is. I could keep going on and on. Our capital markets, our equity markets are broken. What's also fueled this? Retail investors poured in. They're sitting at home, they're getting stimulus checks, the equity market starts to rise, they got to get in on the action. So they started flooding in. And you saw unbelievable amounts of leverage. So we've had an explosion of margin debt. I don't think it's ever good to have too much leverage underneath your assets, because we know when things turn, if you're too levered up, what happens? You're going to get liquidated down in a way you don't want. What also has happened is this other graph looks at call and put option contracts in the US. Now, options trading is largely for very sophisticated investors, because not only do you have to get the price right, you have to get the timing right. 
And you can make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money if you don't get both of those right. But what has happened? The retail trader has become an option trader. And now you have more options trading than the underlying stocks. That is so perverse I can't even begin to tell you. That is the tail wagging the dog. And it is not a good dynamic because when this unwinds, there's going to be huge capital loss for all those people playing in the options market. Now the meme stocks. We've all heard about the meme stocks. It started with GameStop and AMC. Why do I show you this? Because this is probably one of the best examples how broken our, our capital markets and equity markets are. These are two companies that are fundamentally busted. What was GameStop? That's where you'd go buy your video games. I'm not a video game guy, I'm too old, but that used to go to a store, go get your video game. Now what do they do with video games? They just stream them. So what does GameStop sell? Old video games. There's still a market for it, but nothing like it used to be. But it became a hot stock by the Wall Street Bets form Reddit website and Robinhood because it had a huge high short interest by sophisticated investors betting that this company would go bankrupt. So what happened is all this retail money came flooding in. The guys that were short the uh, company had to start covering, which only propelled the stock higher and higher and higher. It blew up a very big hedge fund uh, that had $8 billion uh, of money under management and eviscerated them completely. Well, the same thing has happened with AMC, even worse. Now AMC, everybody gets this one. It's a movie theater chain, right? Well, their business was already declining for years as people started going less and less to the movies. But then all of a sudden, COVID happens, movie viewership collapses, and what also happens? The movie producers, like Disney, can start streaming movies directly to your home television. Now, in the old days, movie theaters would have 60, 90, or a long period of time when new movies came out where they were the only one who got to show them. Now you have this option of streaming, and Disney didn't even give them any time. They would just take movies and stream them right to, those, uh, to people's homes. So the whole business model has been cracked, and AMC has lost billions of dollars. They've had to issue five times the amount of shares. It never has a chance of ever making any money, and yet the market cap of AMC is bigger than it's ever been in history. That tells you how broken things are, folks. Now, it's not just because of all the money that the Federal Reserve has sent in. There's another reason. Our capital markets have been moving to what is called passive index funds instead of managed money. And it's largely wrapped around ET, uh, ETFs. So think of it. You work for a company. You have a 401k. You put money in your 401k. That money goes off to a firm probably like BlackRock, T. Rowe, Vanguard. What do they do with that money? They're not actively managing, looking at one company versus next, one sector looking at another. They're dumping it into an ETF. Whatever basket of stocks in that ETF that gets all that money flows, those stocks are gonna do well. The problem with that is there's nobody looking at it and saying, is this company make sense in its value or does this sector even make sense? It's just money on autopilot being jammed in. And it's some guy at BlackRock saying this, co this company is in that ETF or it's not in that ETF. What's the hot ETF? Best example is the EVs, electric vehicles. So much money flooded in, helped one of the many reasons to create probably the most insane value other than AMC and GameStop, which is Tesla, valued at more than all the auto industry combined and double. In fact, they made an announcement they're going to sell 100,000 cars to uh, Hertz. Uh, that sales will happen over like five, six years, and they've added $300 billion in market cap. I'm sure the CEO of GM and Ford says, we sell 100,000 cars all the time to the, uh, to the uh, rental car agencies. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy. But what happens, all this money flows into EVs. The more those stocks lift, 
the more money flows into it, the more the stocks lift, the more money flows into it. Nobody's looking going, does this make sense? So this is a big problem. I would encourage you all, even if you're having your money managed by some place like J.P. Morgan, a lot of their you know, wealth management is just sticking you into uh, these passive index funds. And it has totally distorted our capital markets and equity markets. Now, I'm going to touch crypto. Now, I know there's some of you that have made a killing on crypto. Good for you. Good for you. I sat there when it was, uh, Bitcoin was at 28,000, and I thought, you know, this thing's probably going to run to 50, maybe 70, maybe 100, but I just couldn't do it. Why? Because there's nothing backing it. You know, at least, you know, you, you may not like what's happening to the U.S. dollar, but at least we have a military, we own, you know, the, all, <laughs> the federal government owns a lot of uh, the land and buildings and assets and can tax all of us. There's a lot of things that back the dollar, even though they're not treating the dollar well. But there's nothing here. And let me give you some examples. I even was stunned when I looked at this. There's now 13,000 different cryptocurrencies. They're listing 2,600 new cryptocurrencies just in the first half of this year. Every day, they're creating new cryptocurrencies. There's this a show called Squid Games. I haven't watched it. I guess it's this real popular show on, on uh, Netflix. And these guys created Squid Games crypto and got all the watchers of it to get whipped up, drove this cryptocurrency up 44,000%. Started off at as a penny. The guys who created it cashed in. Guess what happened? Boom. Went back down, wiped everybody out. Look, a lot of the crypto market got started because of the black market, illegal crime, drug dealing, uh, people trying to get money out of places like China. That really what created it. Very interesting technology behind cryptos, uh, blockchain technology. And now it's becoming institutionalized and a lot of people worried about dollar assets and the value of the dollar. But this is insanity. Uh, Dogecoin, the one at the bottom, it was made as a joke. The founder of it, the guy who created it, said he did it as a joke. And yet today, its market cap is basically the equivalent of Walgreens. Think of that. Something is created by a joke. There's nothing behind it, nothing behind it. And yet, Walgreens that's on almost every corner store, sells you food and pharmaceuticals, which we all need both. And yet this thing, with nothing behind it, has the same market cap as Walgreens. Well, let's turn to the debt markets. Because of zero interest rates, corporations have feasted on debt. You've had an explosion. The blue line is investment grade. The red line is junk debt, high yield debt. Uh, the high yield market has issued more in the last two years. It issued $408 billion last year. And this year, it's on track to even do more uh, through three quarters of the year. Uh, well, it's done. $408 billion through three quarters a year, $423 billion last year. That's going to be a huge problem, folks. Let me take the next. What does this look at? This is looking at credit spreads and risk spreads. What does that mean? This is what they're issuing the debt at. And your credit risk is your default risk. Because why is it called high yield or junk debt? because it has very high rates of default. When the economy turns over, a lot of these companies go bankrupt. And the people that own their debt get wiped out, just like the equity holders. Well, as you saw in 2008, look what happened to credit spreads and junk debt. Jumped all the way almost up to 25% because of all the defaults. Now, if you go buy junk debt, and again, a lot of people don't even realize how much exposure they have because they're just putting money in their 401ks, you're buying junk debt with a yield of 4.31%. When you factor in inflation, you have a zero yield. And not only that, 
you're getting a zero yield and taking massive risk where you may lose 25, 30, 40, 50 percent of your investment. The markets are broken. So, what is the cost of all the sugar high? If you, as I kind of alluded and talked about last year, when they pump money into a system, at the beginning it all feels good because it takes asset values and starts to rise asset values. And everybody likes seeing their stocks go up, their real estate go up, their bond holdings go up, everything starts to rise. But the problem is, once you've pumped all that money into the system, it doesn't stop there. That money starts moving and circulating out of the capital markets as well. And now you're having to start, as years go on, deal with the consequence. And what are we dealing with now? Inflation. Inflation we really haven't had to deal with for 40 years. Inflation, folks, and I'll get into it, is a monetary issue. Because if you think of an economy, an economy as it becomes more productive and becomes smarter in how to operate and technology advancements will always be deflationary. I'll give you the best example. Go back 100 years and you owned a farm. How did you farm and produce your goods, your produce, whatever you were growing? With a horse or a cow and a lot of manual labor. Then what happened? Tractors came along. Then more modern agricultural practices, fertilizers. Now what one farmer can do and how much they can produce is unbelievable. That's all deflationary. That's what a, an economy, as it gets smarter and better and better productivity, will always create. Inflation is a monetary issue. So where are we with inflation right now? This graph goes back to 1958. On the left is CPI, Consumer Price Index. On the right is uh, PPI, that doesn't go back as long because we don't have the data set for PPI. And that's the producer price index. CPI looks at the cost of all goods for us as consumers. Producer price index is the cost of all goods for businesses that produce goods. As you can see, you had this terrible spikes in CPI that started in the late 60s and then rolled through the 70s. Because back in the late 60s, President Johnson created the Great Society. They spent ungodly amounts of money. They started increasing the money supply too much to deal with all that spending that they did. And then Paul Volcker and President Reagan came in and they broke inflation. It was a very painful thing to break inflation. They had to take interest rates to 18, 20%. Anybody old enough to remember it, it was a horrific recession starting, I mean, the economy was just dysfunctional by the end of the 70s because of all the inflation. We had bouts of stagflation, which I'll get into. But then as we moved into the 80s, inflation started to come down because Volcker and President Reagan broke it. And for the last 40 years, we really haven't had to deal with it, but now, it's on the move in a very meaningful way. Now, the Federal Reserve is saying it's transitory, it's temporary. Here are their reasons. The spike in consumer demand and spending will recede, relieving pressure on supply chains and freight rates. Okay. Labor shortages will clear as excessive government transfer payments decline. Okay. Supply chain blockages will eventually clear creating more supply of goods. Eventually, that will get cleared through. And then lastly, China's economic growth rate will continue to slow as the property market collapses from excessive leverage, which will slow the demand of commodities globally, further relieving inflation and supply chain pressures. OK, so those are the arguments that the Fed is making and many people are making about, don't worry too much about inflation. It'll go away. 
Here's some examples to support their arguments. This is lumber prices. Lumber prices before the lockdowns were at $460 for 1,000 square board feet of lumber. All of a sudden, because the mills were shut down and home building was continuing because people went off and started buying homes in a massive way, lumber prices skyrocketed, almost went to $1,700. I had a couple multifamily projects that I literally said, we're not building. It, it, the added costs to build these buildings are just destroyed my economics. And a lot of other builders did too. And then all of a sudden, mills opened up and things started to come back down. Now they've had a bit of a spike back up again, up to $573. But this is probably one of the biggest arguments you'll hear the people talking about transitory. Another one is transportation costs. The uh, index on the left is the cash freight index. What's the cash freight index? It's a function of tr trucking, shipping, and rail. As you can see, the cost has just skyrocketed. And then the one on the right is container pricing. So the containers that these big ships come in, they've gone through the roof because everybody's trying to get their hands on containers. Now the argument for this is once all this gets kind of flushed through the system, the pricing for a lot of this will just drop back down. And then lastly, labor uh, shortages will recede. Because the federal government was paying people more not to work than to work, we created massive problems with labor and businesses not being able to run their factories to produce the goods to relieve some of this pressure. The government uh, transfer payments went up to $5.1 trillion. Now they're down. But with what President Biden is talking about, they want to continue to, uh, with Build Back Better plan, continue to juice and supercharge a lot of uh, the uh, transfer payments, welfare payments, however you want to uh, say it. Arguments for why inflation will be structural. Remember what I said last year. Inflation is almost always a byproduct of fiscal and monetary policy. You produce more dollars, you got more dollars chasing the same amount of goods. And let's look at it. I could take this uh, graph, and I did last year, back to the 1880s. We have never had a time in our country's history where we expanded our money supply at the rate that we have. Last year, we expanded our money supply by 27%. Most years, the money supply will expand by two, three, four, maybe at bad times, 6% to try to do things, 27%. They're still expanding the money supply by 13%. Now think of that. You've had a 40% expansion of your money supply. Well, you've just added 40% more currency dollars into the system. We haven't produced that many more goods. So you're getting a bid, and it's driving inflation. That's why I believe it's structural. Let's take a look at commodity prices. Other than gold, which is a very interesting dynamic, because usually gold performs the best during inflationary times. Why is it not this time? Because everybody's pouring into crypto. I think gold's going to have a great run at some point when crypto gets cr cracked. But other than gold, all these commodity prices have skyrocketed. I pulled out some of the metals, copper, steel, lithium. Look at these movements, both year to date and their gain since January 1 of 2020. Lithium, that's because of all the batteries. 288%. Then you look at agricultural goods. This is what's impacting people's pocketbooks. If you are an older person that are living on a fixed income, or you're a middle or lower income person that don't own a lot of assets, you're getting hammered. I mean, utterly hammered. Your food prices have gone straight up. Look at coffee, 63%. Corn, 47%. Cotton that goes into the making of so much of our clothing, 70%. Palm oil goes into so many uh, food products, 62%. Sugar, 
48%. Wheat, 40%. Now look at the industrial metals. Aluminum, cobalt, magnesium, nickel, palladium, tin, zinc, all of them ripping. We have a real problem with magnesium right now because we get most of our magnesium from China, and they're restricting it. So this thing's going to continue to move, and you can't make aluminum without magnesium. So watch your prices. They're just going to keep moving. And then lastly, livestock. Beef, 26%. Lean hogs, fortunately, that's lower, 3%. And poultry, 51%. Now let's talk about housing. Inflation has hit housing in a massive way. And it was a perfect combination of events. First, you have millennials reaching home buying age. You took interest rates to zero, lowest interest rates we've ever had. And then you've had a lot of people that were living in apartments in downtown LA, San Francisco, and all over New York City, and they wanted to get out. They wanted to either get to their suburbs or they wanted to move to places like Boise or Salt Lake or Arizona or all these different markets. And so we had housing just skyrocketed. So before the pandemic, the average housing cost was 375,000. It's up to 434,000. Now I know all you Californians who would say, "Oh God, is that cheap?" You know, uh, that that ain't much. But if you're living through most of the rest of the country, that's a lot of money. And you know what's sad about this? It's really impacting our young people who are trying to start a family, and trying to get out, and trying to buy a home, and, and uh, it, it, they're having to leverage themselves up so much. Uh, and, and we've just created another housing bubble. Now let's look at uh, housing prices a different way. This is the Case-Shiller Index, the one in blue. F, uh, HFA, Home Price Index, in red, both up. This is year over year, 20%, 17%. Now what's this gray line? CPI shelter. Why is that 4%? Whatever the government tells you CPI is, don't believe it. It's a lot more. We're the only government in the world that does something called hydonic scoring, which I'm not going to get too deep into that concept, but if you improve a product, they don't factor in the price increase is basically to sum it up. But there's a lot of other games they play. Shelter cost are 33%. It's the biggest component of CPI. And what they're saying is inflation has only moved up 4%. But we all know housing has moved up far more because every other index that you can validate has moved up tremendously more. Again, 20% year over year. Look at you know total home uh, average selling price. I'm going to get into explaining why. The government moved to something called owner equivalent rent. Instead of tracking the sale of homes and saying this is what home prices have done, they now do a survey that basically asks you, how much do you think you can rent your home for? They do it twice a year. So under owner equivalent rent, which is the biggest component piece of shelter, the other two components of shelter are rental costs for multifamily and lodging away from home, which are student housing and hotels. That's all shelter costs. But the biggest component by far is this OER. Folks, trying to measure inflation by calling people and saying, what do you think you can rent your home for? Most people would have no clue. OK, I think I can rent a little bit more. But what's going to happen as we go on? That line's going to finally start catching up. So the inflationary numbers are going to start showing what real inflation has been. I think inflation is, it's not at four some odd percent, five percent like the Federal Reserve and CPI saying. I think it's running seven, eight percent easily. Now let's go to another reason why, ener uh, why inflation is going to continue to get fueled. Energy prices. Think of all the things that energy goes into, making of products, the production of products, the movement of products, the movement of all of us, our cars, our planes. 
Energy cycles into everything. We had the greatest benefit for 15 years that started at the end of kind of the late 00s, where we had this thing called fracking that was technology advancement that boomed our energy production. And let's look at that. So this is West Texas Inter Intermediate Crude and Brent Crude Oil. As you can see, you had this massive spike up uh, in 2007, 2008, as the Federal Reserve was pouring money, creating inflation in fuel costs, sending it up. Oil, a barrel of oil went up to uh, almost $140, uh, almost $150 with Brett, and then it came collapsing down and then continued to head down. Why? Look at the nat gas prices, the one into the upper right. Nat gas prices came cratering down because what was happening in the Permian Basin in Texas and New Mexico, and what was happening in the Bakken in North Dakota. And so we became energy independent. We were starting to export energy. Problem is now, because of all these ESG goals, how many of you know what ESG is? It's this thing that the government has been pushing and big institutional investors like BlackRock have been pushing. ESG is environmental, social, and governance, and requirements on companies to adhere to these different standards. It may be governance. You have to have a certain amount of females or minorities on your board of directors uh, and, or, and social. It, it could be an environmental. It's forcing all these companies big oil companies, all the rest, to underinvest in the production of fossil fuels and invest in green energy. And what it's done also is the capital markets, they're not flowing money to our energy complex. So it's being starved of capital. So we have less wells being produced. And then you had President Biden. What was the first thing he did when he came in? He canceled the Keystone Pipeline, canceling other pipelines. By the way, that's insanity because if you want to save on energy, oil, move it through a pipeline. It's safer and it's less costly than having it being shipped by truck and train all over the place where you get a lot of spillage. But that's what they've done. And now where you have utilities that can't even get enough nat gas they're starting to go back to using coal, which is the dirtiest of all kinds of fuel, and look at what's happened to coal prices. I'm telling you right now, one of the easiest bets in my book is that oil is going to go over $100 a barrel very easily. I don't know when that is, next three months, four months, six months. Depends how cold the winter is. But energy prices are going to continue to grind higher, and already these moves are going to continue to cycle in to CPI and PPI. These are gas prices. Look at the red line. This is what's happening with gas prices nationwide. It's $3.39. Now let's talk about utility rates. This is by PG&E, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric. The dotted line, up 20%, is CPI. This has been going on since 2013. Look at the rates of inflation of, of this area. It's unbelievable. And why is San Diego Gas and Electric so expensive? They shut down a nuclear power plant that was totally functioning. They decommissioned it. By the way, if you're worried about carbon, nuclear plants don't produce any carbon. Yeah, there's you know nuclear waste, but uh, you know, there are people that argue, Bill Gates and others, that will say we should absolutely be moving vastly more nuclear if we're concerned about global warming. So uh, it caught, it, San Diego and California have the highest electrical costs in continental United States and San Diego the highest in, in the state. Interesting, though, solar may be an, a remedy, a helpful tool, for those who own properties or own a business. Let me explain why. Economics of a $1 million solar investment. If you 
build a solar system for a million dollars, you immediately get an investment tax credit of about 26%. It depends. This is for corporations. It depends if you're individual and how you're doing it. But you get this big solar green energy tax credit. Then you get a bonus accelerated depreciation of basically 18%. So day one, year one, should I say, you make a million dollars investment, you're getting back almost half of your investment. Then, depending on the cost to build the solar system and what your energy rates are, obviously you make more money in San Diego than someplace here like Orange County where average utility uh, kilowatt costs are about 14 cents. So San Diego is even more profitable. But your year one savings are about 115,000. So you're generating, right off the bat, a 21% return. But here's the other be big benefit. Because the state is so messed up, we're having brownouts. And guess what? For a lot of businesses, that's not good to have brownouts. It shuts down their factories, or if you have refrigeration or things of that, you have to throw a lot of your products if you're down for too long, unless you want to run generators, which a lot of them have had to build. So it helps secure your energy. Secondly, who knows how much these things are going to move. If you can start capping a percentage of your energy costs year over year, those, the, your returns may go off the chart. So we've gotten into the solar lending business. Hey, James, come on up here for a second. If you're interested in talking about solar, we will finance it. We will do a lease structure with you. Or we'll actually own it because some people can't use the tax credits. So if anybody wants to talk to James about solar, this is the man. So you can see him and grab him out to the side, all right? Thanks for the pitch. Hey, no problem. <laughs> Got to make a pitch, because honestly, folks, I, I uh, solar, I don't want it. I, and then I started getting into it, because originally it was just all a tax uh, game. But then I started looking at it, because what happened to the, all these utility costs? I'm like, no, we've got to do this. And uh, it, it's definitely worthwhile um, investing in folk and looking into. All right, so where are we? Here are the inflation scenarios that will play out. Is it transitory? People argue it has or is already peaking. Is it structural, where all costs, including salaries, continue to rise? Everything just continues to move up. Does it turn into stagflation? Persistent high inflation combined with high unemployment and a stagnant demand in, in the country. That's what we had in the late 70s. And eventually, if inflation keeps moving, it will always end up in stagflation. Why? Because if salaries move too much, then businesses' margins start getting collapsed. They start investing less, and then uh, labor starts getting laid off. If uh, price of goods moves up, but salaries don't move up, people can't afford. They move out of apartments. They, they, they you know, move in together, kids with their parents, or parents back with their kids. They start spending less. So, Eventually, structural inflation almost ends up always in stagflation. Or do we all break into deflation because of the massive amount of debt that we just can't continue to carry it, and at some point the economy rolls over and then everything just craters down? Look, politicians and the Federal Reserve have created what I call Pandora's box. The red is our US debt. As you can see, our debt levels to our GDP was pretty manageable up until the Great Financial Recession, averaging about 40, and then started moving up to 60%, and then just kept moving. We have been so fiscally irresponsible over the last 15 years, it's been mind-numbing. And the problem is, now our debt to GDP has exceeded our GDP and now we're at 125%. Once an economy, any economy, uh, does that, they enter in what is called a debt trap. And once you're in a debt trap, 
there's only two ways out. One is default, which many, many countries do. Think of Argentina, think of Southeast Asia back in the 90s, Mexico, I mean, most of Latin America is defaults at some point in time. Many African countries, many Asian countries, Eastern Europe, all gone through default. Problem is, US government can't default. Because if we default, we create ourselves into a depression that will go on for decades. So what is our option? We only have one option, and that's where we're going to continue to inflate. Now, what are these two lines? The red line is our interest expense and our pay goes. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, those are our entitlements. The blue line is our federal tax receipts. Folks, where we are right now, what we're spending on entitlements and just the interest costs of our debt exceeds our total federal tax receipts. And by the way, we've had a boom in federal tax receipts. One of the reasons why the Federal Reserve is pumping up all our stock market so high, because it creates more activity and higher valuations creates more tax revenue. But we can't even match that just with the things we have to pay. Now, Let's add this on. What that line is, that's just the cost of operating government, our Defense Department, Health and Human Services, HUD, Housing and Urban Development. We can't even cut. You could, you could annihilate all of government where it doesn't, we don't even have a Defense Department. We're still spending more because of how big our entitlements and how much debt we've wrapped up then what we're taking in. What does this mean? The Federal Reserve is going to keep printing money. That's all they can do is keep printing money. Now they're talking about tapering. They will taper. But if all of a sudden rates start going haywire, they're going to come right back in and start buying bonds and monetizing it. This is the Treasury maturity schedule. The first bar is what they have to roll this year, uh, fourth quarter of this year, which is almost three and a half trillion dollars. And by the way, the red is what the Fed owns, the blue is non-Fed. Other governments, us, our institutions, foreign institutions. Next year, they have to roll almost four trillion dollars. We gotta roll six trillion dollars of debt next year. This is gonna have huge implications, particularly when they start tapering because now you're gonna start draining some liquidity out of the system. They're still adding a lot of liquidity to the system, but soon it's gonna start draining. That's why I showed you all the stuff with the equity markets. Be careful with your investments. This is the yield curve, the treasury yield curve. The red line is the 10-year treasury. It's at 161 basis points. The, and then that's the two-year treasury, the blue line. It's at 46 basis points. Two-year treasury is almost doubled. As these inflationary pressures continue to build, people are proje projecting that the Federal Reserve is going to have to lift short-term rates to stem inflation. How does the Fed, how does any central bank break inflation? By rising, raising interest rates, slowing the economy down, and cracking inflation. The problem we have that is not a tool they can use very easily anymore. Why? Because every 1% increase in interest rates adds another 29 or $290 billion of interest costs. So they have to keep rates way artificially low. Rates should be much higher than where they are today. Much higher than where they are today. Now, the Fed can always control short-term rates, but it, they have a much harder time controlling long rates because they've expanded their balance sheet and buying so much they've been able to do it. But if they start moving out of the market, they're gonna have a harder and harder time. Now, this is what's happening. It's called financial repression. This is what central banks do to take care of their biggest client, the federal government, is it's a backdoor tax, inflation is, number one, and two, they're giving you negative yields for buying their debt. So blue lines, the 10-year treasury, you're getting 
uh, or excuse me, the, uh, the red lines, the U.S. Treasury, you're getting a 160 yield. Inflation is moving at 4%. So what is your effective real yield after inflation? Negative 2.4%. That's what you're losing every year owning a 10-year Treasury bond. So folks, we are in the everything bubble. There's many graphs I could go look at to show you this. I like this one. This is Warren Buffett. It's called the Buffett Indicator. And its measurement is to determine whether the equity markets are overvalued or undervalued by looking at the total value of the stock market to US GDP. Typically, as you can see, this goes back to 1971, the stock market value, a little bit below, at times higher. That was the internet bubble in 2000, 2001, where it peaked up, but pretty much tracks GDP. You had the great financial recession, went way, went way down, then kind of came back. And as the Fed kept expanding its balance sheet, it kept moving higher and higher and higher. Now, we're at 207%. We're so, we're so wildly overvalued. And you can look at almost any asset value. That is the case. So I like to say, and I've heard others say this as well, so it's not some big revelation by me, but printing money does not fix excessive debt. What does it do? It delays the problem into the future and passes it on to our children. That's what we've done. We pulled everything from the future, loaded up ourselves up with a lot of debt, and now we're going to have to do it, deal with it, but largely our younger generation, our kids, are going to have to deal with it, or our grandkids. It transforms the problem into currency devaluation and trade wars. That's already started. All the world trying to manipulate their currency lower to generate greater export growth and economic growth. And lastly, it transfers the problem into inflation, asset bubbles, and inequality. I find it ironic that the very people screaming the most about inequality are the ones who have created it the most. Because their policies, oh, we got to give more money, we've got to spend more money at the federal government, they don't even understand that by doing that, the central bank has to go in, flood the system with money. Well, who benefits from it? It's people that own stocks, real estate, assets. If you don't own assets, you're getting hammered. So that's the heart of the inequality that's happened. You know, you've made Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk hundreds of billions of dollars. But the average guy, the older person living on fixed income, they're getting clobbered. So let's take a real quick look at the rest of the world. How do other major economies compare? I'm not going to spend much time on Europe. I'm going to give you one graph. Had the spike down, spike back up. Hasn't had as good a growth this past year, but they didn't send anywhere near the stimulus. And they're probably set up for a better year going ahead. And COVID hit them a little bit harder. China, though, I do want to spend two seconds on. China's slowing. Their growth is the slowest rate that they've had since they've entered the WTO at 4.9%. Their economy is the second largest economy in the world. China, though, has gone on a massive debt expansion. They've been growing their debt by 55% the last six years. My view is they probably haven't had much of any growth the last six years without all this debt. China is now one of the most indebted countries in the world. Here's a big problem China has. China has absolutely horrible demographic trends. Their current birth rate is 1.2 child children per couple. You typically need 2.2 just to keep your population at parity. So their population is shrinking. And what the other problem is, if you look at this, the age from 15 to 64 versus 65 plus, where is the population growing the most? 65 plus. Where is it shrinking the most? The younger people. 
they have very, very big problems, demographic problems. Here's another issue, urban versus rural population composition. China benefited massively as people were coming out of the rural areas, going into their urban cities and building these big buildings and condo towers and factories and all the rest. Really helped fuel a lot of their expansion. Now you have about 900 uh, million people that are living in their urban setting and rural is 510. You're probably at kind of that level where it's not going to change that much more going forward. So you sucked in a lot of that growth that happened by building these big urban centers as all these people were coming off the farms. So the question is, is the bankruptcy of their biggest property company, as some people say, is this the next Lehman, Lehman Brothers? Uh, Evergrande's, Evergrande's default. Is it a black swan event? Because what you can see here by the graphs is that property values have fallen depending on the index by 36, 36%, the lowest one's only 10%. Problem is, real estate comprises 30% of China's GDP. Comprises 70% of all their citizen savings. You know, the way people save money in China is own multiple different condos, even if nobody's living in them. Their real estate market is valued at 55 trillion, four times their GDP. By comparison, just so you understand that, the US's real estate market is valued only at twice our GDP. This is all very reminiscent of what happened to Japan in the late 80s, early 90s. So does does their property market collapse spill over into a black swan event that starts affecting the entire globe? Now let me get down to my predictions. predictions. The goal of forecasting is not to predict the future, but to tell you what you need to know to take meaningful action in the present. So here's my predictions. Prediction. US GDP will remain positive for the year, but growth will slow to two, three percent. However, there's several risks that could trigger a black swan event. Now, a lot of people are thinking GDP is going to be a lot stronger next year because we will be fully lifted from lockdowns. People will be back flying. Restaurants will be back going. Sporting events are already back. So you're going to get that huge big lift as everybody comes back. The reason why I have a lower GDP forecast is because I think we pulled a lot of spending from the future into last year and into last year and this year. So I think GDP is going to be slower, and with inflation continuing to move, I think it's going to crip household spending, because all of a sudden, if you're spending more on fuel, you're spending more on your food, it's just harder to go use and spend on discretionary items. What are the black swan events? Well, Biden, depending on what the tax package is, if it's too big, it could have a very negative impact on real estate, on equities, a whole host of things. China's property market, we just described that. Could that be a black swan event for the globe? Geopolitical tensions. Could there something happen between China and Taiwan? Could there be a major terrorist attack now that what's happened in Afghanistan? Or could we get a new COVID strain that puts us in panic and some form of lockdown again, let's hope not. I hope none of these things happen. But you have to look into the future and say, what are events that could trigger a big economic contraction? On the unemployment front, I believe it will continue to uh, decline, but employers will start having difficulty finding qualified candidates due to the labor participation rate remaining low and the lack of skilled labor amongst younger generations. Also, vaccine mandates could have uh, a negative impact on employment. I'll tell you, we have a big problem in this country with our labor force. And you all have experienced it. Try to get, if you're a company and you're making big goods, try to get a high qualified welder. In your home, how long does it take to get an electrician or a plumber? How much does it cost now? 
the bulk of a lot of our skilled trade are all in their late 50s and early 60s. They're retiring out. You talk to people in those fields, we don't have the young people coming up behind to take these. We're going to have a big, big shortages of trade and skilled labor. Uh, vaccine mandates, I don't know what will unfold with that. But you're having problems now. We're, we may have very big disruptions uh, during the holiday traveling season because pilots, uh, air traffic controllers, we've already seen a couple incidences like that. So um, police forces in Chicago, firefighters in New York, I, I just can't predict it. Interest rates. My prediction for interest rates, short-term uh, rates will remain anchored at zero for the first quarter. Uh, maybe one 25 basis point rate move at the beginning of summer. I don't think there will be another one. Could be at the end of the year, but I'm more in the camp of 125 basis point rate increases. I know uh, many on the street are predicting two. I think it'll more likely be one. The 10-year Treasury note will experience greater volatility and swing between 130 and two and a quarter. I don't think the Fed will allow the 10-year Treasury to go more than two and a quarter. It should be a lot higher than that. I mean, much, much higher. And if the Fed was out of it, my guess is the 10-year Treasury would be, I don't know, high twos, low threes, somewhere around that. But um, I think they will step in if it starts moving too much beyond two and a quarter. Prediction for asset values. Equity markets have several significant headwinds that should cause a meaningful market correction. The Federal Reserve will be tapering with a potential rate increase. You're starting to put less and less liquidity, and with having to service this debt, you're slowly draining money out of the system. Democrats could pass significant tax increases that will affect corporate and capital gains rates. Look, the equity markets, our discounting uh, mechanism to uh, discount cash flows. That's, that's what the equity market should. A property functioning equity market is looking at the cash flows of a company, discounting that back using some rate and arriving at a value. Well, if you change the corporate tax rate, you get less cash flows. And if you raise capital gains rates, well, guess what? Your economic return changes. So that would have a negative impact on equities. And then lastly, year-over-year -year revenue and earnings comps may be negative by uh, Q1. You're already seeing many companies having this issue. They had such a boom, depending on what area they were, uh, during the heart of COVID, that all of a sudden, like a bike maker, a big boom, and all of a sudden, okay, there's less bikes being bought, and so the year-over-year -year comps get more difficult. So I think the equity markets are set up for a pretty, uh, potentially pretty good uh, correction. Commercial real estate values will remain strong and capitalization rates uh, low due to two factors. Other than commercial office, rental rate increases for most asset classes. Look what's happening in industrial, look what's happening in multifamily. We're having rental rate increases in all my multifamily complexes by three to 5%. This isn't slowing down. Uh, industrial is skyrocketed, so even retail is starting to see that. So I, I, I think that's going to bode well for real estate. A lot of times, remember, real estate is viewed as a good hedge against inflation. And because of that, the capital flows will continue to flow into real estate. So I think the real estate, commercial real estate markets will remain strong. Housing price appreciation, on the other hand, will stall and potentially see a 5 to 10% correction. Housing has overshot its value. It's so many people can't afford it right now. And what I think will pull it back is the 30-year mortgage rates will increase modestly, but just even a modest increase will what you can pay for a home be changed based upon your earnings. Housing values, as I said, have become unaffordable to too many people uh, in the public. Supply of housing will increase with foreclosure moratoriums being lifted. It's now been lifted in California. It's being lifted in New York, New Jersey, all over the country. So you're going to have more supply come on. And then lastly, seniors are going to start feeling more comfortable to having people walk through their house, look at their homes, sell their homes, and moving into a, a assisted living or senior uh, living. So I think you're going to have an increase in supply, increase in mortgage rates, 
that will bring down housing. I'm not saying anything we're going to have a housing bust like we did last time. We're undersupplied with housing. I'm just saying pricing will take a knockdown. Oh, and there's another factor. There's been so much speculation going on in housing, and now some of those big speculators, the big Wall Street funds, and even individuals are starting to back off. In fact, Zillow had to announce their whole home buying flipping program was such a disaster, they just pulled out of the market. That was yesterday. Their stock's down in two days, like 30 35%. Political predictions. The president's proposed $3.5 trillion Build Back Better plan will continue to have great difficulty getting passed, but I eventually believe after much party infighting, the progressives will have to accept what Senator Manchin from West Virginia said. He's not spending more than $1.5 trillion. And he has held the line, and he's held the line, and he's held the line, and I don't think he's going to change. And after the elections uh, in Virginia on, on Tuesday, and how close it almost came for the a Republican challenger in New Jersey, of all places, where a Republican almost won there, I think a lot of moderates in the Democratic Party, which is now a very small part of the Democratic Party, are going to say, this is insane. In fact, if you listen to Larry Sumners, who was uh, Bill Clinton's chief economic advisor, or Furman, Jason Furman, who was Obama's chief economic advisor, they both think, this whole 3.5 trillion is insanity at its worst. We already have massive inflation ripping and you want to dr drop another giant money bomb and more entitlements on the system when the system can't even take it? Uh, tax increases, they're having a heck of a time arriving at any uh, tax package. So I think it's gonna be a hodgepodge of different tax increases, but there'll be no meaningful increase in cap gains or uh, corporate rates, there'll be some increase. They're definitely gonna get that 15% minimum global tax rate. This is one I really agree with them on because I've always hated it. Companies like Goldman Sachs or Apple can put all their technology in offshore places and pay no taxes. Most of our top corporations pay little to no taxes. So this is one thing that, you know, at least leveling the playing field, but there's also problems with that. There's a high likelihood of increasing the tax rates on pass-through corporations like LLCs and LPs because that's been talked about at length. The $1 trillion infrastructure bill will eventually get passed with the help of Republicans in the Senate. Numerous green energy initiatives and tax credits uh, will be included in the Build Back Better plan. And the struggle between the progressive left and moderate Democrats will only worsen after Tuesday's election victory by Governor Youngkin, the Republican in Virginia. I think you're going to see the infighting has been bad. I mean, when they're sending the progressives, uh, sending people to chase Senator Sinema into bathrooms, she's the senator from Arizona that's been holding the red line, or showing up outside a Senator Manchin, uh, he lives on a boat in the Washington Harbor and harassing him, I, I think it's only going to get worse. Last political prediction. We're having an election that will happen right around the time we'll be having this next year. I don't know if it will be before or right after, but I'm going to make my predictions of what will happen with the midterm predictions. What I'm showing you is what happens with each new president in his first term in the midterms of his first terms. And what this looks at is their approval rating one year before the election. So in Jimmy Carter's case, he had a 55% approval rating, but in his midterm, he lost three Senate seats and 15 House seats. President Reagan had a 53% approval rating. He lost one Senate seat, 26 House seats. George H.W. Bush, 70%, remember that, the first Gulf War, he lost one Senate seat, eight House seats. Clinton, his first, he got clobbered. Uh, he was trying to pass Hillary Care, if you remember that. He lost eight Senate seats and 54 House seats. George W. Bush is the only one who did well. Why? September 11th happened. Everybody rallied around him. Everybody remembers him standing at the rubble of uh, the collapse of 
the World Trade Centers and uh, the country was very patriotic and supportive. His approval ratings were through the charts at 87%. Uh, so he picked up two Senate seats and eight House seats. Obama had the worst. Uh, Clinton and him about the same. He had 52%. He lost six Senate seats, and the House got just cratered. 63 seats lost in the House. Trump, he picked up two Senate seats, but he lost the House pretty good, 41. So where does President Biden stand right now? He is the lowest presidential approval rating after one year other than President Trump. My prediction is he'll lose two in the Senate and probably would have lost more, but the electoral map plays very well for Democrats because there's a lot more Republicans than Democrats up in this one. But I think they're going to get clobbered in the House. I, I think the Democrats will lose 50 uh, House seats. Those are my predictions, you know. Uh, we'll see next year how they all play out. All I can do is take the little nuggets of information I have and uh, try to arrive at it. I'll leave you with this one last comment, and this is an important one. The goal of investing in the years ahead should not be on generating returns, but on the preserving, preservation of capital. Be careful with your capital. As I told you, the economic footings of this country are not in good shape right now. So be smart with your money. Don't get yourself over leveraged. Be diversified. Know what you're investing in. Go check your 401k accounts or your wherever who's managing your money and be careful. In saying that, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure having you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful remainder to your year.